the constraints that we agree to adopt and to wear in order to have the physical experience. It, it's like a huge, huge drop in vibration in the being, in the body of awareness of what, what one is. It's a plummet from a place of total knowing, total connectedness, total love, total freedom, down, 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 vibrationally into this point of perspective that was so dense and so firm and, and dark and, and it felt so separate. And it felt like all of what I am was erased. Like I had lost all of everything that I am. We're just on a walk, on a journey where we are visiting this place for, for actually incredible purposes, great, great purposes. If the purpose of the expansion of love and joy through the integration of experience, through choice making in a rich context, this rich context, where we've even come so far into separation that we've forgotten that we're connected <laughs> and that we've forgotten that we are unconditionally loved. This is still what you are. You can never not be this. We've forgotten what we really are for a while. And that is the nature of the human experience. So we vastly transcend this experience and there is nothing to fear. This is just a, a story or a play that we're experiencing for a while. <laughs> what we really are is beyond any description. All that is it exists within the, the great ocean, this, this, which is you can call God or source, you know, the great, the great that which is. There's no such thing as truly being separate from it. We are completely and intrinsically connected and one with the whole and having the potential of the whole. So to have the opportunity to play a character here is like being given the most precious gift in the universe. <laughs> and how then you choose to use that experience to make choices in it, choices that are hopefully more love-based and less fear-based. Fear being reflective of the illusion of separation, it's not a real force. <laughs> but to really make choices that are in alignment with the truth of our being, even here. Now the physical reality is extremely limited. Like we are in an extremely limited state right now, extremely dense, very different vibrational context, extremely different, but it's neutral. So to act in fear is not, not our natural state. Yeah, it's an okay choice, absolutely. But it's su very much suboptimal. Our natural activity is to integrate experiences into what we are, to really know them, to really know them, to really like come to terms with them, you could say. To really allow them to be a part of us without any barrier. Our true nature is non-dual. We use duality, we use context, we use form, but we transcend form. We are much greater than form. So enlightenment is just a very natural return to what we really are. You're listening to the Non-Duality Podcast. This is Nick Hyam from nisagayoga.com. In this episode, Paul Dobson speaks with Christian Sundberg. You, sir, have a very unique perspective on reality that I haven't come across before. And if you don't mind, I know you've had to tell this story a few times, but if you could go in to what has created the context for this perspective you've got, the pre-birth experience mainly. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me, sir. So I will try to describe this, but I have to disclaim that everything we could possibly describe in this topic is vastly beyond language <laughs> <laughs> you know words are symbols they're form and who we truly are totally and vastly transcends the form of our world <laughs> we transcend form entirely so to be able to use some language some sets of form to describe it is just not <laughs> it's not possible so and i'll try to i'll summarize um i've shared this this story many times and there's a lot we could go into, but I'll just say for context. So I remember a very long time ago coming across a being who had been physical before I had ever had a physical experience. So I existed long before I had had physical experiences. And I came across this being who had been physical. And I was completely and totally inspired by the quality of this being's nature, his essence, <laughs> the quality of what he was. And... um this is really hard to describe because it's it's just so rich and deep. But I asked him, and again, this isn't words, it's telepathic. We all exchange, naturally, we exchange information in huge amounts. <laughs> that's, that's how we typically communicate. I asked him, my goodness, what did you do? <laughs> how, how could you be this? How could you be this 
this, this being, and do you feel everything that I feel that you feel? And he shared, yes. And I felt in him this incredible sense of power and love and freedom and, and this expansion and refinement. And I said, I want to do that. <laughs> I want to do that. Like, I will, I will, I want to do that. And I, you know, and he shared that he had lived physical incarnations. And there was one in particular that he had had a chronic long term ailment, a health condition that was very painful for him. And the way that he chose to meet that experience, the quality of being that he brought into that experience and how he met that experience allowed an incredible refinement in his, in his being. And so I, and I said, I, I want to do that. I'll do, I'll do whatever it takes. This is amazing. And he, and he said kind of in a playful way, like not, ne- not negative, but like, yeah, that's what they all say. You know, it's, it's hard in a way that you don't know. Just very like not judging me, just like you just don't know how hard it is <laughs> to, to be physical in this way and to have this type of experience. And I said, no, I, I, I want to do it. And he said, well, go talk to your guides. Okay, so I did. And okay, so now I'm going to jump to a, a period that is somewhat immediately preceding this life where I had, I had lived many times and I was taking a long break after a previous life experience. And I put off coming back for a long time. <laughs> I just was done with the physical thing for a while. I was taking a long break. And this guide kept kept coming back to me over and over and asking, are you ready to go back yet? Are you ready to go back yet? And just putting him off for a while. No, I'm not ready yet. No, I'm not ready yet. And finally feeling like, okay, I'm ready. And then reviewing with this guide what I can only describe as my state, like, this is so hard to describe, but like who I am, who I, who I have been and what I knew, what I understood, what I had integrated, the qualities of my being, you might say. Um, and what, I, and I could see very clearly, very clearly the thing that I needed to like work on. I don't really like the words work on, but, but the thing that I needed to do that would be best for me to evolve through and to integrate. And it was this extremely low vibration fear, a perspective that was such a low vibration that It had bested me in a previous experience and I had in a previous experience been overcome by this fear and, and, and I had, I had been a very egoic monster as a result of this fear in one life and I had caused a lot of damage to other people. And so I was very excited, incredibly excited at the opportunity to re-engage this fear and to integrate this because I knew if I could do that, there would be this absolutely profound expansion of being, a growth and a, and, a, and a refinement, not only for myself, but for the whole. Like it was a, an incredibly powerful thing. If I could, if I could do this and, and bring love and, and some amount of acceptance and, uh, the, the term I like to use is quality of intent. You know, what intent, if I could bring the right intention deep into this experience and integrate it, it would be the most beautiful, amazing thing. But I knew even then that it seemed very daunting in its scope because the vibration was so low. Um, Just uh, I could just see very objectively like, wow, that I have a lot of fear. (laughs) I have a lot of fear. This is a huge challenge. And so I asked the being, is it even possible? Has it ever been done in all of creation? Has any other being ever integrated a, a, a vibration of this extremity, you know, this lowness? And the guide said, yes, and you have all of time available to you to do so. There's no hurry. So I was super excited. And so they brought me a life that was perfect for this intention. And it wasn't this physical life. It was somewhat immediately preceding this life. But the sequence gets (laughs) very strange to try to describe because these experiences take place on higher in a system higher than linear time. But anyway, so they brought me a life that was extremely appropriate for my intention and I reviewed that life in great detail and then I accepted that life and after I accepted it I remember then accepting the veil which is just the term I use to describe the the constraints that we agree to adopt and to wear in order to incarnate and have a physical experience it, it's like a huge huge drop in vibration in the being in the body of awareness of what what one is at least that's how I experienced it And I like to describe it like if you have an amplifier that produces a pitch and you're at a really high vibration, like, you know, this really high vibration. And then, and then the knob gets cranked down to the bottom. And then when it gets to the bottom, just keep turning lower, 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 more, lower still, go some more, lower, 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 lower. That was what it felt like to plummet 
from a place of total knowing, total connectedness, total love, total freedom, down, 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 vibrationally into this, this point of perspective that was so dense and so firm and, and dark and, and it felt so separate. And it felt like all of what I am was erased. Like I had lost all of everything that I am. And it was such a breathtakingly low vibration and I immediately had fear. You know, even though I, I wasn't even born yet, I just had come in, I was, I was in the womb and I was in this physical experience only for a few moments or some very short amount of time. And I was like, you know what? I am not doing this. This is not happening. There is no way I'm going to tolerate this for, <laughs> for a whole lifetime. I'm not doing this. So I, so out of my fear, I, I, I immediately summoned my strength, my might, and I smote the veil. I fought my way back out again. And I was successful in doing that. I found myself back on the other side, but I became aware that I had inadvertently killed the fetus that was to be the body that I was to use, that I was to have and be. And I be, and I had a life review, uh, just like near death experiences described, just, but even for this very short life. And I could see how my fear affected not only the mother, but hundreds of other, because the mother had grief now, like it, she, I'd heaped, I had heaped sorrow on her shoulders kind of feeling. And I had affected her, and not only her, but hundreds of other people and ripples out from her that their lives would be made more difficult because of my fear and how I affected the mother. So I knew, okay, so from that side, it's you know everything's okay. Like there's no real, there's no problem. It's just a big play. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but I could see very objectively like, oh my gosh, I have so much fear. I really got to do something about this. So, so that opportunity was wasted. But I still wanted to do this, so then they brought me this life. And this life was not as appropriate as the first one would have been. It, it was okay. It was pretty good. Uh, but considering the specificity of my intention and the qualities of my being, it was, it was just like a, it was, it was a, still a good opportunity and it was like what they, you know, what they could come up with kind of thing, but it was, it was good enough. And I reviewed this life in vast detail and I'm, I'm, I reviewed what I can only describe as like a flow chart of millions and millions of possibilities of how this life might unfold. And I could, I reviewed it all in the blink of an eye, you know, like within seconds, it was just so easy. It was easy for me to review millions and millions of possibilities all very quickly. And I reviewed how, it, what it would feel like to be me, to be this human in this place and have this type of experience. And I could feel all these different branches of how the life might unfold. And I knew that it was very likely that in my 20s, my early 20s, I would be crushed by a trauma that would just really tr crush me, traumatize me, and give me the opportunity to re-experience this fear. And that did happen. <laughs> I can tell you now that happened. My body is 41 right now, but when I was 22, I had a very traumatic experience. So, um, okay, so then I remember there having to be a moment to say yes, and I don't remember that moment, but I do remember then being in this area I can only describe as like a waiting area where I was in this realm of light and I was excited. And then this guide came to me to get my attention, like, go now, like right now, like very, almost like rude, like grabbing my attention in a very firm and forceful way. And I, and I said, okay, okay, now. And I found myself then in this, this room. It's not really a room, but it was like a place that's kind of like a, um, a shop, like a mechanic shop or something where these beings who are very technical in nature help apply the veil. And they, so they do this thing where they make the veil fit. It's like an organic thing. And they, so they, the, so there's like the life and the constraints of the body and all, all the context. And then the soul has all these rich qualities. And so they do this thing where they make it all fit. And I remember them asking me one more time, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? Because once you say yes here, I knew, I knew that once I said yes here, I was in for the ride. It's like getting into a roller coaster and once you're strapped in, you can't get out <laughs> until the ride's over. And I said, yes. And so once again, I had the experience of the veil coming over me and my vibration plummeting down, 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 way lower, 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 lower. And all of my knowing being cut off and all of the being that I was feeling like it was erasing and being dis and, and disappearing. And arriving to this place that, I mean, it, it, I, I like to describe it like arriving to the vacuum of space, hmm. you know, like a place that's just so empty, so dark, so without heat, 
that's what it felt like to be in this dense, very dense experience of being in the body and in, in the womb as a as a fetus. And I was there for a short bit, and th this time I tried just not to fight it. Like this time I knew, okay, because I remember what happened last time. I just okay, just let the veil do what it will do, and I let that happen. And and then eventually, after I had let go for a long time and I was in the dark, I remember sending one message back to the technicians: Did it take? Did the veil take? And then sending one message back: Yes. So I knew I had made it, which was super exciting. And I was there for a while. And then I said, you know what? I am not doing this. This is so low vibration. This is so dark. I am not going to tolerate this. This is ridiculous. And so once again, because of my fear, I began to summon my might, my strength to fight my way out. And when I did that, the most holy moment of my entire physical life happened. This is so beyond language that the great spirit of God, source, the I am, whatever word you can use, came to me in its in its grand fullness of being, and it said to me, this, so it showed me, I felt the galaxies, and I felt the universe, and I felt they were still in me, and I was them, and, and I felt the churning bliss of our sun, the sun that earth orbits, and I felt so much just burning bliss, burning peace and happiness, and just even in the sun, and I knew that that was still in me. And the voice said, this is still what you are, you can never not be this. And that was so powerful for me. I I was like, oh, because then I knew I didn't have to fight anymore. Hmm. <laughs> because if I was still that, oh, that okay, so I haven't lost all that I am, okay. And I surrendered, I let go. And so then I was in the womb for a while, and then the next memory I have is the day I was born. I remember the experience of stimulus, just like, I had no understanding what was happening. I just had this feeling of cold and touching and shock and, and, uh, light and, and like, what is going on? And I remember looking at these beings, like the nurses even that were there. And I, I knew that there were beings taking care of me, doing something to me. And I felt so much love for them, actually. And I felt this incredible amount of curiosity. Like, where am I? What is this place? What is going on? And I have one, just one visual image memory of the room. I know they say babies can't see, but somehow I saw the room. Um, and I drew the room later from my mother when I was older. And I, and I said, you were here and the, the, the window was here and he was the heating grate and here was the doctor. And she confirmed I was right. I mean, I know it, I wouldn't be, but <laughs> it was just cool to have that, that confirmation. Mm. Uh, so then I have no memory after that for, you know, years. I remember just like sparse, very vague memories of being in a crib and things like that. But, but as I got older, um, like the ages of maybe three or four, I, be, I remember drawing upon this pre-birth experience memory and the flow chart in specific and trying to like cheat, <laughs> see what was going to happen in life. And that ability greatly diminished as I aged, you know, by the age of five or six, it was completely cut off. <laughs> and, and by the age of six, then I had no memory of this at all. So my body is 41 right now. I had I had no awareness of this at all until the age of 30. Uh, after I had taken up a long-term meditation practice, after a few months, I began to have non-physical experiences, out-of-body experiences that were brief at first, but very eye-opening, very not subtle, very worldview shaking. And so then in a similar time as those happened over the next few months i i, I just this memory was just there it wasn't like a big discovery it was like it had always been there it was normal it was the most normal thing in the world it was like leaves had just blown over you know the ground and now they're blown away that's it <laughs> oh there it is and in fact it was so normal that now i feel very clearly that the strange thing is that we don't remember mm. <laughs> that's the strange thing. yeah so, so that's a summary. It's very difficult to put these things into words. And I, I actually don't think that, I mean, I, people are interested in hearing the experience, but I don't think that's what's really that important. I think what's more important is that we remind each other of what we really are and what we're doing here. You know, because all of us are on this incredible walk in the physical. You know, that's the name of the book that I wrote. Um, we're just on a walk, on a journey where we've visited this, we are visiting this place for, for actually incredible purposes, great, great purposes. 
The purpose of the expansion of love and joy through the integration of experience, through choice making in a rich context, this rich context, where we've even come so far into separation that we've forgotten that we're connected <laughs> and that we've forgotten that we are unconditionally loved. And, you know, we've, we've forgotten what we really are for a while. And that is the nature of the human experience. So I think the more important thing then that we can remind each other of is then, is that truth that we vastly transcend this experience and there is nothing to fear. This is just a, a story or a play that we're experiencing for a while. <laughs> yeah, so I went on for a while there, but <laughs> no, no, that's, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. I've heard it before, but I, I always enjoy hearing that. And every time you mention the, um, the great spirit of God bringing you back out and showing you what you are. I, I feel it every time, <laughs> every time you mention it and talking to you one on one now, I really felt it like that relief, that absolute relief, just like, absolutely, oh, thank God, really. literally. <laughs> yeah. I miss it so much. It's like th even thinking about it is so painful. It's I just have so much emotion attached. I, I, I want it. Uh, maybe want is the bad word is a bad word. <laughs> want is a shallow word. I deeply yearn and desire to have to be that again in a full in a full sense, <laughs> because yes. that's what we are, and that's one of the reasons we're veiled. Actually, is because that yearning would be so intense; it's like almost impossible then to do the human thing. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm someone who's experimented with psychedelics and all sorts of exploration uh, methods over my life and I, it in some ways it made it easier but in also in a lot of ways it made it harder dipping back into that state and back out again over and over it made normal life almost unbearable at some points yes. where you just want to yeah. spend the whole time in that state so i can totally totally empathize with that feeling yeah absolutely um, but but here we are there is you know as you say it's a, it's a it is a beautiful, rich experience that we're in, and there is definitely, you know, beautiful reasons for being here. And just based on your perspective and your experience with things, what do you think we are really, and why are we here ultimately? You know, yeah. What is that? Well, well what we really are is beyond any description. Hmm. Um, you know, quick quote: "Say while we're human, we learn to view reality as a place and as a bunch of objects." We see an extern an apparently external world. And then we learn about things in it, forms, you know, the sky, energy, gravity, all these things. And there's certain fundamental properties. No, there's certain non-fundamental properties <laughs> that are specific to our reality that we think are fundamental, like linear time and discrete location, for instance. <laughs> discrete location seems like the most obvious thing to us. We're separate. That thing is over there. I'm over here. You know, so... So I'm just saying that we perceive the world in that way and we come to believe very deeply in objects and in form. So then when we want to know what we really are, we ask, what thing, what are we? What form are we? Well, we are that which transcends and knows all form, all things. We are life itself with a capital L. We are, we are the substance of being that knows all these rich forms. And that substance of being cannot be described. It, it fully transcends all descriptors. So we, there are some metaphors. We, I, I think metaphors are the best way yeah. <laughs> to try. <Yeah. laughs> we could say that all that is it exists within the, the great ocean, this, this, which is you call God or source, you know, the great, the great that which is. And we are drops in that ocean. Uh, we are a part of it. It, it, forever there's no such thing as truly being separate from it we are a part of the whole and we are simultaneously totally free willed individual pieces and also completely and intrinsically connected and and one with the whole and having the potential of the whole each one of mm. us so that is very much beyond language that to tr to try to describe that and so we could so we could say we're individuated pieces of the one and we are like maybe you know fragments or i don't know drop i like i like the word drops in the ocean better because drops you know a drop in the ocean is still connected it's still part of the ocean <laughs> yeah so we could say we're drops of the ocean so what are we doing here <laughs> okay there are many layers of the self and the human personality is just a like a lower 
again, do we transcend duality. So I'm going to use terms in duality yes. that's not not real. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> the duality terms are not real. But we are like the lower end of the self, it, f it feels like, you know, the human personality, which belongs to higher levels of the self. And the higher levels of the self participate in the process of evolution, which is a process of expansion. And that is the growth of what is, the growth of love and joy ultimately, because our true nature is love and joy and freedom and peace and, and fun. <laughs> you know, that that is our the substance of what we are. Okay, so then we will venture into manifest experience. That means experiences where discrete things are possible, like here, where someone who's watching this video sees a certain shape. You know, they see this guy talking and they, they hear a, a sound. And then, and then we have to interpret that. And we got to apply our own meaning to it. And then we got to think about it and use thoughts, which are a new type of form. They're a form in the mind. And we have to think about what do we, what do we think about that? That whole process of form context permits an incredibly powerful expansion of the self and of the whole. And that expansion is then a refinement of what really is, a refinement of, of spirit, of consciousness, which is a refinement and an expansion of love and joy, ultimately. You know, that, that's really what it is. So we come for that purpose. And so, but we, you know, often here, though, we don't experience that every day, right? I mean, <laughs> this is like super, super, you know, Earth is a context that is extremely uh, unique. Ex we could even call it alien in how separate we feel. It is such a high contrast level that there is an incredible amount of opportunity on Earth or other physical worlds. It doesn't have to just be Earth. So to have the opportunity to play a character here is like being given the most precious gift in the universe. <laughs> it's like being handed this precious, precious thing and you, out of all the trillions and trillions and trillions and endless trillions of beings and all the vastness of all of creation, you specifically, were given the chance to be this, to play this character, to be have this human life. And how then you choose to use that experience to make choices in it, choices that are hopefully more love-based and less fear-based, fear being reflective of the illusion of separation. It's not a real force. <laughs> yes. But to really make choices that are in alignment with the truth of our being, even here, mm. if you can do that, there is an incredible growth that you that is only, I don't even want to say it's only possible here, but it's it's, we could say, practically speaking, it's only possible here. Uh, to to grow in certain ways so so the world the universe is like a, a simulation that is provided to us for the expansion of being and it's so convincing as well isn't it i mean it's unbelievably convincing i find yeah no it's really it's ridiculously convincing i mean i know as i say these things that sounds woo woo or something but i'm a i mean i worked as i mean i'm a, I, i'm a left brain type person <laughs> You know, I worked in the nuclear power industry as a project manager for a long time. So I'm used to using that. I know. I know how this sounds. And it is extremely convincing. But the thing is, the more... Um, how do I put this? The greater the depth of the realness of it, the greater the opportunity. Hmm. So it's very convincing because if you want to really be you, the human, you got to be you, the human. You know, if you really want to know what it's like, you got to actually do it. You can't just, you know, th metaphorically, you can't stay in a higher state and read it in a book. You got it as a metaphor. You have to come and be it because the growth of being that we're doing, the integration of experience that we're participating in is about actually doing it, yes. <laughs> actually yeah. being it, actually actualizing love, not just talking about it, you know, coming in and really knowing and so yeah so it's, so it's highly convincing <laughs> very consistent the physical reality experience is ridiculously consistent and persistent <laughs> yes i remember the first time realizing that in a you could call it a peak experience and <laughs> thinking oh my god that i've i thought that the human stuff was the real thing but this is 
yet you know that it's not that it's yeah. not real <laughs> i just found exactly. it hilarious though i actually couldn't stop laughing i was in hysterics that i was a hundred percent invested in the human stuff exactly and that yet, <laughs> and yet this other state um so to speak was clearly <laughs> the, the more go-to, real the, the home state you know was, yeah. yes absolutely it, it is hilarious then because I'm, so I'm reminded of the near-death experience of Amy Call. Mm. When you say that, she uh, she described how after her NDE, when she was aware of who we really are, she remembers these two guys coming to her front door. They were cable repair guys, and they came to her door, and they said, we're here to hook up your cable. And she could not stop laughing <laughs> because she felt and saw who they really were. They yeah. were these totally free beings of joy who had no limitation, no need. Acting real serious. We're here to fix your, we're here to hook up your cable. <laughs> and it just seems so ridiculous. So we take it so seriously. Like we take our roles and our stories and our, our demands and our pains. <laughs> mm. So, and our fears so seriously. And I'm not making light of it because I get sucked back into it over and over and over. I mean, that's the nature of it. But it's just like you said, it's hilarious how free we are and how we really don't need to take the human condition serious, that seriously. I mean, it's important to, I, I, tr I try not to say the words don't take life seriously because then that implies you don't need to ever wield effort. And sometimes it is very much appropriate in a spiritual context to bring your, your strength to bear. <laughs> yes. That's true. Yeah. But we also don't need to take any of it seriously <laughs> at the same no, time. No. It's just a play. Everything's fine. You can do whatever you want with life. You're free. You're free to change your beliefs. You're free to go outside right now. You're free to whatever you want. Now, there will be, you know, a result of your choices. You know, there's there's a cause and effect. That's going to happen. But, but you're still totally free. You're completely free to make any choice. And there's a beautiful joy in that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's just... I do wish everyone could maybe tap into that at some point in their lives or at least come to know it just in some way that everything is fine. As everything is absolutely yeah. fine. Actually, the state of affairs is the best possible state of affairs imaginable. And beyond that, as what we are, we're just kind of <laughs> going through this seemingly pretty drudgery type <laughs> human yeah, existence. Low vibration by comparison. Yeah. yeah. Very, very. <laughs> And as you say, if we can bring that, though, if we can bring that that love, I mean, we're at the advantage that the fact that we are that love, you know, we are that love Man. and joy. I love that. I love that statement that we are at the, an advantage because we are that. Oh, I love that so much. <laughs> the house always wins. So we're, we're exactly. The house. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I love it, man. The house always wins. I totally agree. You know, like here in the physical, we tend to think the house always wins means reality is cruel and cold and harsh and uncaring. No. <laughs> the cruel, cold, harsh, uncaring is very limited in, in its scope by comparison. It's, you know. But yeah, I, yes. I totally love that the house always wins. I have a, one, of the, one of the essays I, I have in the book is called Goodness Can't Help But Win. Mm. Yeah. It can't. It can't help but win in the end. No matter what happens, no matter what tragedy or devastation happens, life uses all experience for the good. All experience. It can't, it can't fail. Even if the entire human race were to be wiped out in a nuclear event or something <laughs> like something that seems terrible it's fine yeah it's totally fine it's just a small it's a small part of all it is it's a simulation it's okay we go do something else it's fine you're fine even death is not a problem death is not a problem yeah it's it it's beautiful man i love that that's how good this is though that's how good this is you can say stuff like that and people think that just sounds crazy <laughs> that's how good this is isn't it there's a good uh, I, I like so that this is a good conversation because the reason it sounds crazy is because we become that deeply associated with the negative perceptions we become so deeply associated with the negative beliefs negative self-perceptions and negative beliefs about the world that that sounds crazy I'm pointing that out because it's important to remind the individual that the power is actually in you. You apply the meaning. Now, the physical reality 
is extremely limited. Like we are in an extremely limited state right now, extremely dense, very different vibrational context, extremely different, but it's neutral. <laughs> it doesn't actually have a charge. It's just, it's like if you're laying on a couch and somebody comes over and puts a very heavy weighted blanket on you. The weighted blanket is neutral. You get to decide. It's okay if you decide, I don't like this. This is too heavy. I don't like this. Or you can decide, okay, it's heavy. I'm going to go for a walk. See what I can do. We have all the choice in our reality with how to meet the physical, how to meet the circumstances of our lives. We absolutely do. <laughs> and it's only because we've forgotten that we get so deeply wrapped in the thought patterns and in the beliefs that we seem, it seems like that, that good, the truth of the goodness can't be true because look at all the pain, look at all my fear, look at all the story. I'm not making light of that because I know that once we get a momentum built up, it's very hard. It, it can seem hard at a given point in time to relieve ourselves from the momentum, the momentum of thought, the momentum of fear. <laughs> but we always have the power in the current moment to stop and change that momentum, even just a little bit. Like the universe wants you to succeed, put it that way. Like maybe not, I won't even limit to the universe. This, the, the higher context, the spiritual context, you are it. It's a part of you. It loves you. It wants you to succeed. So, so when there are these moments, you know, so that's why we get these little nudges because you don't have to do it all once. Just meet your experience wherever you are now in the best way. Whatever small thing. It could be brushing your teeth. It could be how you blow your nose. It could be how you interact with the person next to you at the store. <laughs> how you admire the sunset. It doesn't matter. Every You get to choose how you meet reality, and that's what's so powerful. That will allow the individual to, to return closer back towards the truth of what we're talking about. Because it's, it's like basically let go, like if you have your death grip on a rope <laughs> and you're holding on it till your knuckles are white and you're like bleeding, your hands are bleeding, the way to relieve yourself is actually to let go of the rope, not to s squeeze more rope. Hmm. We do that with our stories and with our, our ego, our ego responses. You know, we're, we get addicted to the ego patterns, to the thoughts, everything. Just relieve my fear, relieve my fear, fill, fill the hole, fill the hole, whatever I need next, whatever next substance, next person, next event, next action. Tell me something else. I need to distract myself now. Dude, we do that our whole lives. When you let go, face the fear of letting go of the rope. It actually is a move back towards the peace. <laughs> Yes. The rope is what hurts. <laughs> yeah. It's so backwards to how we generally feel it is, isn't it? It's yeah. like, I would say intuition, but that's not our real intuition is actually to move back towards that piece. But maybe our human intuition is to grab tighter onto the rope. You know, it's a metaphor that you use quite a lot is when you've got your, your fist really clenched up, it becomes difficult to then open your palm. But the natural state of the palm is to be open, isn't it? So that's like the rope metaphor. But it feels like, well, the momentum's gone that way. The momentum's gone in, you could say, in the direction of fear, in direction of our stories, the egoic stuff. But every time, there's never anything wasted. If we can just bring just little aspects, every single time we spend even just a second, presence, you know, just bring a bit of love, a bit of presence, just a smile, whatever. Any, any In any way you can, it builds up momentum, doesn't it? The momentum then switches the other way and it unravels itself absolutely and so it's it's uh it's not impossible it's not you know it might seem impossible but it's not impossible we, we will succeed <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> like you said the house always wins yeah the question is how much uh friction will we create within ourselves and with others until we do that you know we just you know are we gonna we, it's okay and if you want to have more friction that's an okay choice too but you don't have to <laughs> that's it yeah. there's no there's no wrong experience is there there's no no you know right and wrong is another sort of human mindset you could say an egoic kind of mindset or whatever we want to call that but there's no actual right and wrong all experience seems to be ultimately sacred and valuable <laughs> And rich. Yeah, it's a, it's a. This is one of those topics that's the ego of the mind. The thinking mind has a really hard time getting its head around. <laughs> so exactly what you said. All experience is sacred, and there is no. 
There's no moment that is not sacred. There's no choice we can make that is not okay. Okay, simultaneously though, it's, it's I, I'm very careful with this to say the words, there's no right and wrong because then people take that in a certain direction. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'll say that we, you, you may be able to say that as long as it's deeply understood that love is our true nature and there are ways to actualize and reflect love versus fear. So to act in fear is not, not our natural uh, state and acting in fear and ego, ego arises from fear, is painful. <laughs> so yeah, it's an okay choice, absolutely. But it's su very much suboptimal, you could say. If you and then when you and then when you pass, you can see very clearly how, how you affected everybody else because they are you too. <laughs> We're all connected, <laughs> so you experience it from their point of view, and then it can be seen. Wow, that was like when I was angry at that person. That really wasn't the the most you know the most optimal way to help that person. So in that way, there is definitely a sense of. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm careful about the words right and wrong. I'm just saying in that way, there's definitely a sense of love, of love-based choice making versus fear-based choice making. That's the kind of, I 100% agree with you saying that. Um, that's kind of the, the difficulty in talking about this because there's an understanding that all experience is absolutely just, well, it's all God essentially and it's all, it's all exactly. sacred and it's all perfect. <laughs> Yet there is that aspect where, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, if you can bring bring as much love to each, you know, passing sort of uh, quality of experience, uh, those interactions and etc. as you yeah. can, you know. That's so what we're here to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what we're here to do. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's what we're here to yeah. do. Mm. Absolutely. So there's a kind of, that's the kind of irony, isn't it? You, If you can see the, the, perf the sort of, the sacredness of all experience you tend to be doing that anyway <laughs> yeah tend to be so it's not just a kind of theory is it it's not a theory, another theory to be taken on exactly yeah exactly the the reality of our being in the reality of our being the love loving choice making makes sense it's not just like oh we're trying to be trained into some new behavior and that's why we come to be human no there may there's behavior that will arise we will use behavior but our nature is love. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I know it's very difficult to talk about this kind of thing, but I was, I was wondering if you could maybe try and put some words to this. <laughs> so mm. in my experience of whatever it is we're calling the soul, when I've sort of dissolved into that state, whatever we want to call that, it's a completeness. It's not lacking whatsoever. It feels full. It feels full of love, joy, bliss, all the things that you mentioned as well. And it just... It feels not lacking anything whatsoever. From that vantage, what? How can we expand and evolve <laughs> what that is? Um, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is one of the topics that in in duality sounds like a paradox. So here, okay. So there's two things that are simultaneously true. One, the soul is totally perfect needs nothing, has no requirements, <laughs> none, not a single, not a single requirement. And is, and is, and is substance of what it is, is perfect. And yet within all realms of manifest experience, the soul is only so good at actualizing its true loving nature in a context. And so it participates in, in the process of evolution to ever refine itself in that direction. So how can they both exist at the same time? It's very difficult to, to describe in duality, because like I said, it seems paradoxical, but they're simultaneously true. You could say that the substance of the soul is always perfect. Always. It can't be, it, it can't be anything else. And, and yet that substance refines through manifest experience. You know, we, we have engaged in a deep and rich multi-dimensional process of evolution. It's not just on earth. <laughs> many, many reality systems exist within this great process of refining ourselves ever and ever towards, we could say, the perfection of the whole. We could say that each drop in the ocean has the potential of the whole. And so, always is in the process of evolving itself towards that perfection, which also grows the whole. So, does the whole need to grow? No. 
Is it happening? Yes. Because why? Because uh, because love is good. Hmm. Because joy is good. Joy and love are good. And because and and, and also in, in the same vein, this sounds different, but it's actually the same. And because we're we're curious. <laughs> We're powerful, creative beings who are curious. So we will come even into a state like this. Hmm. Really push the boundaries here. Really do it. We'll even do that. Even as we are simultaneously without any need. We choose to do it. I mean, that, that's really important to understand. It's not a, it's not forced upon us. It's not like we're being used in some engine or something and we're just, you know, hapless factory workers or something <laughs> yeah no we we choose to engage experience for the purposes of the refinement of being and for evolution because we we see what it is and we and it's a, and, and the opportunity is amazing and we know that we can't be harmed we can't fail we can't truly fail so why not so why not try man like why not try that i want to try that i want to do that and then we get here and we find out holy crap i am vastly imperfect <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I think you would probably agree that when, this is really hard to describe. But if you even touch with the tip of your pinky, metaphorically, the higher self, it is the most humbling, just in, like incredibly humbling, and not just the higher self, but the whole. If you even approach it, it is identity identity shatteringly humbling because you see your own the depth of your own imperfection um so so we are both perfect and deeply imperfect at the same time <laughs> so yeah it's a very difficult one to sort out for the human mind isn't it because it can't you it's one or the other isn't it uh, but it just happens to be that things are that way <laughs> they yes. paradox is a good word for a human being because it admits that we can't really go beyond that exactly i i try in my book to identify paradox and why you know what it is and why it's not really paradox it's only a paradox from this perspective it's only it's only a paradox when you buy into a perspective of duality that's not fundamentally real and now from the dualistic vantage point you're trying to look up back towards, you know, the transcendent. It will look goofy because from here, it can't, it's either A or B. That's the very nature of duality. Um, okay. So, but we don't need to, um, fear that because the deeper parts of us know it. Like I'm saying, if you, if you really feel into this topic, do you, do you not feel the preciousness? Of who you are, the I. Do you feel? Do you know that you're? Do you feel the preciousness of life? That's that's the perfect nature of life. That and then you can feel that. And then e so then even though that's true, do you also not see? You have fear. That's okay. They both are arising. Like I, I, I actually, I rephrase that. It's not that the perfection arises. The the, the manifest arises within the perfection. We can put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, the perfection is, and then perfection is exactly. Yeah, so again, that's the advantage. The perfection is, and then you've got this fear. But the perfection is, well, the perfection is just not even comparable to the to the, this tiny little <laughs> fear that's appearing. You know, it's Amen. so it's. Um, Amen. Yeah. So, <laughs> so how how best? I mean, we may have touched on it already, but how best can we meet that fear? How best can we? yeah not work through but just be with that fear i mean maybe for example how did you in your experience because well, you had that really difficult time in your 20s how was there part of you that was able to come through there and just just be with that and recognize that i need to be with this experience in some some kind of way which i can't do as a as an egoic self and just really uh be with it fully in your sort of loving presence or I mean, I'll let you. I'll let you describe how yeah. how that was. So not at the time. At the time, I was only traumatized, and I had PTSD for eight years, or maybe seven or six or seven years. So the um, all right. So 
the key, there's a key mechanism happening that it's really important to identify, I feel. So the fundamental substance we could say is consciousness. That's what's real. So what's the fundamental thing that it, that's hap that doing? It's, it's, in, it's intending. It's wielding intent, which means it's making choices. The cho choice making is actually not directly int intent operates seamlessly through choice making. <laughs> But the intent itself is the key active ingredient and the power. So why do I identify that in the context of this question? Because it has to do with what intent you are bringing into your own life and your own fear. Okay, so what intent helps to process fear? Well, it, it could mean a great number of things, actually. But I'll just highlight what's been very important, at least in my own walk. It is the intention of completely feeling everything and allowing everything. Not fighting, not rejecting, because fear happens, because here's when we associate with a self-perception or, or a perception about the world that is not in alignment with the truth, and that hurts, and then we reject, and rejection hurts. So we need to reverse the rejection. Now the problem is that when we get to our deepest fears, they feel too big to face. That's why they're fierce. <laughs> That's why they're down there. That's why the ego is trying so mightily to fix the problem. Even the very experience of being separate is one heck of a, you know, problem that that we, the ego is tr trying so mightily to fix. Even the experience of being separate itself. Even the pain. Even the negative self-perceptions. We can allow ourselves to feel and know all of it eyes wide open. You know, it's not about fix. You don't go into it and say, okay, I'm afraid of, you don't say, I'm afraid of being afraid. I'm afraid of being in pain. So I'm going to go feel this just so I can get rid of it because I don't like it. I can get rid of it. You almost have to, I mean, it, th that's why intent is the key. The quality of why you're doing it, how you're doing it, what really are you, how are you meeting the experience of your pain? You don't meet it to get rid of it. You need it because it's there and it's in you and you honor yourself enough to feel everything you feel. Just if you just sob as the little boy or girl that was still four years old and is still rejecting being criticized by the parent or abused or something. To, to feel it, to know it, to, to really, really allow and because we're here to integrate experience. That's what, that's what we're doing. We're integrators of experience and that means when we have an experience, even painful experiences, all experience, good good experiences too, we we are trying naturally, like our natural activity is to integrate experiences into what we are, to really know them, to really know them, to really like come to terms with them, you could say, to really allow them to be a part of us without any barrier. And so when it comes to our deepest fears, that is so powerful. Now, if you do that and you got really, really deep fear, uh, for, okay, so first of all, the deep fear may be buried underneath hundreds of layers, you know, of, <laughs> of ego story. So it may be difficult to even locate the fear. But if you can get all the way down to the bottom, you know, and you find the core, that root, it will feel like the fear is too big for you to even feel too big to even process. It will feel like it will kill you if you if you even touch it. <laughs> it will feel like lifting up a rug and finding a monster of such size and scale that you will die. You'll feel like you'll die if you look at this, if you feel this. So you could say the metaphor is like if a tornado comes to you and it picks you up and you know, like it feels like a tornado is going to kill you. So it picks you up off the ground, it swings you around in a bunch of circles, and then it throws you to the ground. And when the tornado is done with you, it it, it can feel in so intense that the tornado is throwing you around. But when you're thrown to the ground and you finally come to, you look, you open your eyes, you're not dead. You're actually alive because now all that energy that was in the tornado is gone. It was able to deliver its message. It was able to be felt and known. And now it can just dissipate in the wind. You know, and, and it's and then you and so what's left, the you that is there is far stronger because now you've done that you've processed that you've felt that it can go and now you know forever in the eternal one now what it is to know that depth 
you know, and now it's not greater than you. Y you've integrated it. So willingness. So to make a very long story short, willingness to face everything and to feel everything is key. So in some ways, it's fairly, it's very simple, but also very challenging. You could say, I mean, you literally just, it's ridiculously challenging. Yeah. You've got to be there for it. So that's, that's simple, but at the same time, it's challenging because being there for it involves being, well, what most humans aren't willing to do, including myself, uh, which is be uncomfortable. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You got to be incredibly willing to be uncomfortable and to be vulnerable. But, but here's the thing. Is it, so am I saying that now you need to be an uncomfortable person? No. What's uncomfortable is rejecting being uncomfortable. And what's uncomfortable is not processing. Living in fear is painful. And I, and I, and I still have fear to pro, I mean, I'm still working through this. This is not, you know, <laughs> it's not a simple thing. I'm just saying that being in fear all the time hurts. It, it, it is, it is a relief, a deep and profound relief from the pain of being in fear when you face it and process it and be, allow yourself to be uncomfortable and to feel it. And it can mean anything. It can mean being, uh, you know, in a place where you're vulnerable in some way or, or naked or, you know, like, or exposed, or it could be you don't want to face some perception or some experience that you couldn't come to terms with. I mean, it could be so many things, so many, so many contexts and forms that seem to trigger and give rise to the fear. The fear is the, um, when I say fear, I'm talking about not the story. I'm talking about the deepest, deepest vibrational, like why it's not okay. Hmm. Go feel that. <laughs> yeah. And you, I don't know how you feel about this. In my own experience, it's almost like you can, and you can also be with the rejection as well <laughs> so you okay nice. i can't deal with this now i can't i just can't do it you know and then there's there's that there's another layer and as long as you yes. pick it up somewhere along one of those layers it's like the whole house of cards is pushed over <laughs> all the layers are broken so you can just it's not like okay i can't be with this right now fine can you be with not being with it and then can exactly. you be with not being able to be <laughs> so that's beautiful uh, that reminds me so much of an eckhart tolle quote and I don't, I don't remember the exact words but it's something like Forgive yourself for not being at peace. The instant you accept your non-peace, your non-peace will be transmuted into peace. That is the yes. miracle of surrender. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Because, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's not bringing more of the same to it then, isn't it? It's bringing peace to it as opposed to, we basically just got to stop the violence, stop the war. You know, obviously on a whole human civilization level would be nice but in yourself like and go okay now i need to be with fear and i'm going to be with fear and then oh i'm so stupid because i can't be with fear you know <laughs> yeah then that's a new struggle exactly so 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 one thing one thing about this you you don't have to go looking that hard because what's in you that wants to be processed arises into your experience over and over <laughs> like like the deeper parts of you know. And so you don't have to look very far. Just look at your experience. Look at what you feel right now. Look at what your relationships right now. Look at your habits, your thoughts right now. And just, uh, you know, and just like you said, be at peace, even if you're not at peace and work with them. It doesn't, this whole thing, this whole process doesn't, even though I just described a very, a very, um, you know, visceral, strong, I just, just described the tornado throwing you around and throwing you to the ground simultaneously while that while that may be the level of willingness to feel that you may need to have simultaneously you don't need to approach it as if it's a dire problem <laughs> it's not a dire problem none of it is dire none nothing is dire except that you've bought into it that it's dire so when it arises deal with that non-dire problem just face it just be there with it uh, you know be gentle with yourself <laughs> put it that way yeah exactly sort of self-compassion is important isn't it and it's so strange because it's again this is going into what what we might refer to as paradox but it's one whole you know there's one always god you could say but then we've got these what seemingly individual soul situations and we're we're each experiencing these human lives but there's this, the whole and yet everyone is so unique and individual and their, their whole journey of through this human life is so 
profoundly unique, isn't it? So yes. you might not necessarily have a massive trauma in the same way you've had to go for it. It might just be yeah. tiny increments at a time or it might oh, yeah. be oh, yeah. almost not even noticeable. It might be a whole different different thing going on for this for a particular person. So it's it's a really interesting um, situation where everyone's yeah. got their own little thing going on. Well, I, I'll just make one comment about that. That So when we're human, it appears that we all have very similar experiences uh, because we all have two eyes and a head and shoulders and a similar body structure. Mm. <laughs> you know, we see we see a human experience that looks like it's quite shared. But the nature of the soul is unbelievably unique. Like each one of us is so unique, has had so much rich, varied, beautifully different experience, different qualities, different history, different different core nature that's very unique I, I just think that's important to mention because you know we tend to look around and say oh everyone is just oh i'm just another human no <laughs> you you are not just another human you are a precious beautiful very complex unique you beautifully says yeah it's 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 amazing it's beautiful i think that's really worth mentioning as well because because we are temptation is to judge others as <laughs> as what we think's right and wrong from our own experiences like well i would have done this you know and they shouldn't be doing that b based on our own experience based on our own very unique you know you could say energy system and soul system what what have you and so really it's it's impossible to judge another human being for what's what it, exactly it, they're yeah. going through <laughs> it really is the the, the true judgment uh, is not a judgment it's a knowing how do i describe this what, what, the system knows the totality of all of your experience. Every single, <laughs> every single constraint, every pain, every decision everyone ever made that impacted you, every, every cell in your body, every piece of food you put in your body, every, you know, everything and how everything has affected you, it knows. And you are understood. You're completely understood for making the choices that you made. You know, it's not like, like if you're wearing a, a heavy weight and it's difficult to, you know, like run fast with a heavy weight on your shoulders, that's not, that's not a bad thing that you're, you're honored for carrying a heavy weight and trying to run. It's not like your judge, like, oh, you only made it 10 feet. That that's you know it's not, it's not like that not like that kind of judgment and here we all are in an extremely constraining difficult <laughs> context by comparison and and it's seen like I I've, I've heard a couple of near death experiencers where they describe that from the other side you know we who are human are seen as like superheroes or something you know because we're because we're so we're willing to come into this level of context and I, that re that resonates with me because of my pre birth experience after my after that first failure I had, I could see I had so much respect for the incredible players in the game <laughs> that were willing to do this and play this ridiculously constraining, difficult game on Earth. Like, oh my gosh, I it was an it was just so much love and respect. Like I can't even tell you. And here we all are thinking that we're just these little inconsequential humans that are, you know, subject to the powers of society and the system and money and you know, all these things. We're we're not just that. Uh, yeah, I, so I, I just I think that's an important message too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And the the issue with that as well is us thinking that us thinking we're just these little humans and you know subject to all the laws of society, the laws of physics, the laws of everything. You know, it's the science <laughs> is our kind of seems to be at, in this day and age seems to be the god, doesn't it? And everyone that's everyone's go to point most people anyway is science they go well you've got a brain and you're just a brain and all this kind of stuff i don't know if that's the kind of because you strike me as a pretty intelligent guy i don't know if that's the kind of thing you've you've come up against and and how you deal with that sort of thing so i mean of course on the surface that's a very basic conclusion that it looks like the brain is producing consciousness of course but it's that is a very surface level thing that's happening and I, I love the process of, I wholly support all science because the, the process of determining what reality is <laughs> and using object, objectivity and skepticism, that's a really important process. 
I mean, I'm one to say, don't ever just believe something. Go, go, go look, go experience, go make your own determination. This is not about establishing new beliefs. I mean, everything that I say, I don't, I don't want people to just take something I say and start believing in it. <laughs> That's not going to help, but you really got to, you got to go see it yourself, like evaluate it. And what happens, so but here in the physical, our scientists and so many of it, we're, we're so deeply focused in the material that we think the material is reality. So, of course, within the material system, which has certain rules, you know, our science is the study of those local rules of how the physical system actualizes. But eventually, science will expand because that physical rule set is a subset of a much, much bigger reality, a real reality, the spiritual reality. The spiritual reality is not a woo-woo fairy tale thing. It's not just happening like in some imagination land. It's, it's, it's real. So, eventually science will expand and realize well, a lot of what's arising in the physical is actually originating deeper and you could call it in a higher dimension you know you could say that um so yeah i think but i think it's very normal for now to look at this is just where the human race is at <laughs> in our understanding we're actually a very young species when it comes to where we are in our understanding um, you know, we like to think we're nice and, nice and advanced. We're, we're actually in the dark ages <laughs> with our understanding in relation to the, the larger context and to what's really going on. So, you know, we will eventually get there. Until then, one, one last comment I'll make. So, as a process of investigation, science is a wonderful process. I, I encourage people to take that process of investigation towards something that we don't typically think to investigate. And that is consciousness itself, awareness itself. That is, if we can investigate what our own awareness is beneath thought. Just go look. Don't make anything up. Don't make up any new stories. <laughs> you know, you don't need a new, don't think, don't even think about it. Just go very, very objectively and, um, uh, faithfully. Just go look. And you, and, and so that we call that process meditation. And it was, it's so important, I feel, because as we investigate what our own awareness is itself, under, beneath thought, don't settle for a thought, don't settle for a new thinking understanding. Well, go and look, go and feel, go and actually engage it yourself experientially because there's so much there. <laughs> the, the, the truth and the vastness of our being is there to be discovered not as a new human thought, but it can be known within the deeper mind which you are a part of. So it can be, I could even, you could even say it can be understood, but I don't tend to use that word because that implies human thinking. And I'm trying to direct towards something that transcends human thinking. It is a very deep, tangible, personal interface with that which knows thinking. <laughs> mm, yeah, it's a knowing, isn't it? It's a knowing isn't the correct word either, but there is no correct word, but it's a knowing. <laughs> it's a change, almost a change of gears where you go from thinking mode and the thinking mode, once you go into the knowing mode, <laughs> you could say the thinking mode just looks so tiny and so, and so, um, yeah, just well, not dumb is, is quite a harsh word, but almost yeah. a, bit, a bit dumb in comparison because knowing is like instantaneous. There's no time lag. It's just boom, there. Exactly. And it's much more complete and thorough and it's, and it's broader. And human, human thought is, if you, if you think of it in a vibrational context, in the larger spiritual context, human thought is like very slow and crude and dense. It's like throwing around dense baseball bats slowly by comparison to the incredible amount of uh, uh, knowing and, and information, I could say, that is there that we can very easily interact with. So, but it's while we're, while we're used to the dense, clunky, painful human thoughts all the time, though, that seems like all there is. <laughs> yeah, it's like Windows 95 versus whatever operating systems on a uh, super quantum computer in a thousand years yes. or something, isn't it? <laughs> it's yes. just not comparable. <laughs> in obviously within the context I usually speak within the non duality, and there's a lot of coming from Advaita Vedanta, sort of a Hindu tradition, essentially. But uh, we kind of have quite an open context where it's not specifically in any tradition. But there's obviously a lot of talk about enlightenment within the Eastern traditions. Um, and I wondered where that fits in with all of this. Is there a human enlightenment? Is that a human-made idea? Is that something that's not really relevant to what we're talking about? 
or I mean, and if enlightenment is what we are, then yeah, I just wondered in your in your particular experience with it, or what your perspective on that is. Yeah. Well, I think enlightenment means something different to different people. Um, I'm very careful to use that word or quantify it. I'll simply say, though, that the process of awakening to our true nature is a very beautiful process. And that is really what we're talking about, because our true nature is (laughs) non-dual. We use duality. We use context. We use form. But we transcend form. We are much greater than form. So... Enlightenment is just a very natural return to what we really are. It does take a certain level of... Oh boy, be careful how I say this. There is a a natural mastery... Okay, so if we, if we integrate experience of form to a certain degree, we eventually always discover it's not really the bottom. You know, when, when we... So when we really integrate our experience and really go through the process of seeing what we really are and what our thoughts really are, we will naturally return to what we really are beneath the form. You can call that enlightenment if you like, but it's very non-special because it's just what we are. Um, and so, and of course, all of us are into it in varying degrees of, like, our, like we each have our own relationship with the experience of form in our own consciousness. We're each at different places. We each have different fears, different limitations. We're each at a different stage of evolution. You could say that. And evolution is complex and multifaceted. It's not one line. (laughs) So because of that, each individual's relationship with the higher divine, with their deeper selves is unique. So enlightenment can mean very different things for different people. Uh, But yeah, I think it is pertinent because like like we've been discussing, that's really what we are. We are that higher nature. (laughs) Yeah, beautifully put. I totally agree with all of that. (laughs) You've got a, a great book, A Walk in the Physical, which does discuss some of what we've been talking about and, and some non-dual stuff. It goes into your story in a bit more depth and just has some great sort of wise advice for from your perspective of living in general. And I think it's a great book. I'd highly recommend it to anyone listening. I believe it's up for free. Uh, yeah. I got the Kindle version. but uh, <laughs> Yeah. No, I, that's something I want to make sure everybody knows is that it's available for free. It's certainly not about money. If you go to my website at walkinthephysical.com, there's a book page. The third link down on the book page is to the free Google Books version online. Yeah, I uh, the book is, is something that I felt for six years really needed to come into the physical, and 